Norman Manukova from the book show on Radio National. It's my great pleasure today to be in conversation with Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, as you see, um, she uh, has had great success with her first novel, uh, Purple Hibiscus, having won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for First Fiction. Her second novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, won the 2007 Orange Prize for Fiction. Her work has been translated into 30 languages. She now lives partly in the United States and partly in Nigeria. But she's here with her new collection of short stories, The Thing Around Your Neck, stories set in Nigeria and in the USA and in a place in between. And we'll talk about that place in between, which is really a place in the heart and the mind um, uh, when we begin our conversation. But today we're going to begin by hearing a reading from the new book. Please welcome Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie to Sydney. Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for coming. It's, it's always lovely to um, have people actually come when one does public things. <laughs> so, so thank you for coming. I am going to read from a story called The Shivering in <coughs> in the story collection, and it's set in, in Princeton, in New Jersey, and it's, uh, it's set in an apartment building that, uh, I suppose I shouldn't just, I should just read, it's set up so much. <laughs> On the day a plane crashed in Nigeria, the same day the Nigerian first lady died, somebody knocked loudly on Okamaka's door in Princeton. The knock surprised her because nobody ever came to her door and announced. This, after all, was America, where people called before they visited, except for the FedEx man, who never knocked that loudly. And it made her jumpy, because since morning she had been on the internet reading Nigerian news, refreshing pages too often, calling her parents and her friends in Nigeria, making cup after cup of Earl Grey that she allowed to get cold. She had minimized early pictures from the crash site. Each time she looked at them, she brightened her laptop screen, peering at what the news articles called wreckage, a blackened hulk with whitish bits scattered all about it like torn paper, an indifferent lump of char that had once been a plane filled with people people who buckled their seat belts and prayed, people who unfolded newspapers, people who waited for the flight attendant to roll down a cart and ask, sandwich or cake? One of those people might have been her ex-boyfriend, Udenna. The knock sounded again, louder. She looked through the peephole, a pudgy, dark-skinned man who looked vaguely familiar, though she could not remember where she had seen him before. Perhaps it was at the library or on the shuttle to the Princeton campus. She opened the door. He half smiled and spoke without meeting her eye. I am Nigerian. I live on the third floor. I came so that we can pray about what is happening in our country. She was surprised that he knew she too was Nigerian, that he knew which apartment was hers, that he had come to knock on her door. She still could not place where she had seen him before. Can I come in? He asked. She let him in. She let into her apartment a stranger wearing a slack Princeton sweatshirt who had come to pray about what was happening in Nigeria. And when he reached out to take her hand in his, she hesitated slightly before extending hers. They prayed. He prayed in that particularly Nigerian Pentecostal way that made her uneasy. He covered things with the blood of Jesus. He bound up demons and cast them in the sea. He battled evil spirits. She wanted to interrupt and tell him how unnecessary it was, this blooding and binding, this turning faith into a pugilistic exercise to tell him that life was a struggle with ourselves more than with a spare-wielding Satan, that belief was a choice for our conscience always to be sharpened. But she did not say these words because they would sound sanctimonious coming from her. She would not be able to give them that redeeming matter-of-fact dryness as Father Patrick so easily did. 
Jehovah God, the weapons fashioned against us shall not prosper in the name of Jesus. Father Lord, we cover all the plains in Nigeria with the precious blood of Jesus. Father Lord, we cover the air with the precious blood of Jesus. And we destroy all the agents of darkness. His voice was getting louder, his head bobbing. She needed to urinate. She felt awkward with the hands clasped together, his fingers warm and firm. And it was her discomfort that made her say the first time he paused after a breathless passage, Amen, <laughs> thinking that it was over, but it was not. And so she hastily closed her eyes again as he continued. He prayed and prayed, pumping her hands whenever he said, Father, Lord, or in Jesus' name. Then she felt herself start to shiver, an involuntary quivering of her whole body. Was it God? Once years ago, when she was a teenager who meticulously said the rosary every morning, words she did not understand had burst out of her mouth as she knelt by the frame of her bed. It had lasted mere seconds, that outpouring of incomprehensible words in the middle of a Hail Mary, but she had truly, at the end of the rosary, felt terrified and sure that the white, cool feeling that enveloped her was God. Now, the shivering stopped as quickly as it had started, and the Nigerian man ended the prayer. In the mighty and everlasting name of Jesus, amen, she said. She slipped her hands from his, mumbled, excuse me, and hurried into the bathroom. When she came out, he was still standing by the door in the kitchen. My name is Chinedu, he said. I'm Ukamaka, she said. They shook hands, and this amused her because they had only just clasped each other's hands in prayer. This plane crash is terrible, he said. Very terrible. Yes. She did not tell him that Udenna might have been in the crash. She wished he would leave now that they had prayed, but he moved in, across into the living room and sat on the couch and began to talk about how he first heard of the plane crash as if she had asked him to stay, as if she needed to know the details of his morning ritual, that he listened to BBC News online because there was never anything of substance in American news. He told her he did not realize at first that there were two separate incidents the First Lady had died in Spain shortly after a tummy tuck surgery in preparation for her 60th birthday party, <laughs> while the plane had crashed in Lagos minutes after it left for Abuja. Yes, she said, and sat down in front of her laptop. At first, I thought the First Lady died in the crash, too. He was rocking himself slightly, his arms still folded. The coincidence is too much. God is telling us something. Only God can save our country. Us, our country. Those words united them in a common loss. And for a moment, she felt close to him. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you think that these two characters would be so intimate with each other? if they had met in Nigeria and not in America? No, no. I mean, I think in some ways the story for me was about how um, being away from home creates um, connections and bonds that would never happen outside home. You know, that, that the reason he feels, um, because what happens in the story is that he, he, he goes and looks at the mailboxes in the apartment building and sees this Nigerian name and has this need to connect to somebody who shares the same thing as he does. And it would never happen in Nigeria. I think that the divisions of, um, mostly in their case of class, would, would probably have meant that they would never have met. Because he is a Pentecostal prayer um, and she is a Catholic. Um, that, well, less that than she is an upper middle class person and he isn't. Um, and that living in Nigeria, they probably wouldn't have any opportunities to, to meet each other. But does that um, Pentecostalism um, um, uh, penetrate all classes? It does, it does, so that it, it, it's less and less a dividing thing. I mean, it's impossible to engage with contemporary Nigeria. And I think in many ways, contemporary sub-Saharan Africa, without engaging with this um, uh, 
phenomenon of, of Pentecostalism. Of, yeah. Is it different from the Pentecostalism that um, you see in, uh, in America, that's sort of the blood of Jesus stuff? Is there something particularly <laughs> sub-Saharan? I think that it's, it's similar, of course, but I think that um, there's a sense in which it also... I mean, Pentecostalism, it, it, the, the way that it manifests itself in Nigeria, it's... It, it's um, I mean, in the U.S., I, I, Pentecostalism is very much about sort of the, the awareness that the spirit is active today and miracles can happen, right? So that you can sort of turn this water into wine um, as we're here, which would actually be a good idea, wouldn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't. But, <laughs> but then you could turn it into vodka. <laughs> I think we could You're halfway there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in the Nigerian version of it, that there's a greater sense of um, sort of the evil spirits being traditional religion. Right, that it, Pentecostalism has, in some ways, um, constructed itself as something that is anti the old ways, and the old ways are uniformly demonized in a way that I mean, I'm not sure that the the U.S. really doesn't have that as much. So um, this story also, I mean, when we read it, we understand towards the end that um, this man is um, is a gay man, and uh, and she has to adjust herself to this fact. And, uh, and then I thought of another uh, story in, in this collection um, called um, Jumping Monkey Hill, which is a story um, set in um, uh, a, a, a creative writing or, or, or a, yeah, an African writing workshop, which sounds a lot like it probably came from real life. <laughs> where, where a whole group of African writers are from different parts of Africa and they're under the um, uh, tutelage, I suppose, of a um, so-called African expert who's um, a white bloke uh, who's ex explaining to them what an African story is. And, and one of the things that are not, is not in an African story is a gay character. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, you've, you've, you haven't written an African story here. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that workshop and the story about that workshop? Um, Yes, that, that story, Jumping Monkey Hill, is in fact autobiographical to an extent. Um, I had, uh, but I suppose the reason I don't like to talk about the sort of the real thing behind it too much is that for me it wasn't so much about, you know, I try very hard not to settle my many scores with my fiction. And um, <laughs> so I, don't, I really don't want it to become about the, the workshop itself and the man who ran it, um, with whom I obviously did not get along. But for me really it was about somebody having the in some ways the audacity to tell a group of young, impressionable writers from different countries in Africa what an African story was, what qualified as African. So if you, you, know, if you were writing about Zimbabwe, you couldn't write about people who fall in love. You had to write about the horrible Mugabe. And I remember thinking then, you know, Mugabe is a disaster, obviously, but people are falling in love in Zimbabwe. And that the, the job of fiction is to tell those human stories. And I just felt that, um, you know, that there were also people there who probably, because of, of the, the question of power, because they need people like this man to get agents and to get published, will toe the line and do the sorts of stories that they're supposed to do. But young writers yeah. are looking for guidance, mm -hmm. um, you know, no matter where they're coming mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it, it can be hard to decode which part of the guidance to accept and which it part is, is, which, is unreasonable. Yes, which I, for me, which I think is the heartbreaking thing. I mean, I, and also the idea that there are certain things that one, you know, the homosexuality, for example, being something that one shouldn't write about because somehow it isn't African, um, which I, I found ridiculous. And um, so I suppose by his standards, my, a lot of my fiction wouldn't be African. But um, <laughs> You don't seem to be worried about that. Not very much, no. <laughs> you, um, you've got a, a, a story called Imitation, um, which is um, really set in America. Um, the, uh, uh, the wife of a, a big man in Nigeria is, has been sent to America with her children to live in America. And she hears over the grapevine from her friend that her husband has moved a young woman into their home, back home. And... Um, so it's an interesting story coming from a, a continent of polygamy mm. um, where one has the impression that the idea that of the second or third wife is kind of normal um, in some cultures. Um, 
but it's, it works against that idea because mm. this woman isn't so happy about it. Mm. Can you talk about that story? No, I, I think polygamy is something that um, in some ways is quite um, accepted, right? But, but then there are also the complications of class that you find that, um, you know, increasingly sort of educated mid, upper middle class women in Nigeria, that, um, that they have a, that sort of middle class morality that I think cuts across all cultures, um, particularly middle class Christian, Judeo Christian morality. So the idea of monogamy is, as the accepted norm, you know, people buy into that. Um, so, and I think this woman, I mean, I think in the end the story was really about a woman who, who finds the possibility of, of a voice, who hasn't had a voice for so long, who hasn't, who, who, for whom it hasn't occurred that um, it's possible to speak, right? Because she's with the big man who's wealthy and she feels very grateful that he married her because she's, she's not the sort of woman that she imagines he would have married ordinarily. And... And so she doesn't speak for very long. And, and really what happens is that hearing about this other woman, that it's less about the other woman and more about, it gave her an opportunity to speak, to find that she could in fact have a voice and have a say. Um, and the story sort of came from a, a friend of my sister's who, who um, had a sort of a similar experience. I remember my sister telling me about, because this does happen, that you sometimes have wealthy Nigerian men whose families are in the U.S., and who have sort of the big house, and often they have the, the domestic help who are shipped in from Nigeria, so they don't have to pay them outrageous American um, uh, salaries. And, uh, and so it's, it's an interesting arrangement. It's always interested me to wonder what that sort of life is like. But then hearing my sister talk about her friend, I remember thinking, and I wonder what that's like, and that's really where the story came from. Um. There are other stories about uh, set in America, um, in, in, in campuses, or um, young women usually who are making their way in this strange new territory. This um, looking after people's children, um, getting a, an, an eye on the culture that mm. they're they're in. Um, the fears of, of American parents the, uh, about bringing up their children, uh, fears. In, in a culture full of food and mm. full of the things that you'd think m would make them sort of not so much worried about their children. Mm. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about um, American parenting? <laughs> well... <laughs> Shall I pontificate about... No. I, I, I mean, actually, I do think that it's sometimes the, the, that, that kind of worrying about protecting one's child from things that people like us might consider just part of being human, part of growing up. You know, you want to protect your child from disappointment. You want to protect your child from failure. The things that one might argue actually a child needs to experience, um, I think sometimes comes from having too much. I mean, that there's, the possibility, there's the sense that in which, you know, you, there's a lot of food, so you don't have to worry about food, and one needs to worry about something. So then you worry about you know, um, your kid didn't get the, the prize in the piano competition and that sort of thing. I, I did, in fact, um, I was a babysitter when I, when I was an undergraduate um, in Philadelphia, but for a really lovely family. Um, and, but it did strike me that in some ways that parenting in the U.S. had become this, this sort of um, collection of anxieties and, and while I understand, of course, that to raise a child is a difficult thing, I sometimes wondered why, you know, there was just anxiety about everything, everything imaginable. And I thought, you know, it would be nice to somehow stop and just appreciate what you have instead of over worrying too much about things that haven't happened. I mean, it's sort of little things like um, people hyperventilating about car seats for, for children who are five years old. And, you know... And then, of course, I can't help thinking about children in Nigeria who are five years old who don't have car seats and who sort of just get into the car and shut the door and, and, and they go. So it's things of that sort that, um, that struck me about. Uh... But again, I have to say that, of course, it's a particular set. I mean, it's, it's sort of, again, it's, it's people of relative privilege. It's, it's middle class um, American parents because, of course, you go into the inner cities and, um, and the concerns are different. I mean, it's an entirely different thing. You, um, you, you said the other night in your um, opening speech that you consider yourself a storyteller. Um, so who told you stories? 
Uh, I, I also consider myself an eavesdropper. So I sometimes don't, I, I just, you know, I, I don't even need to be told. I just like to you know, sit in a coffee shop and eavesdrop and then write notes down and later use it in a story. I, so really the world told me stories. Um, my, my, uh, I suppose my father did tell stories. My grandmother did to an extent. We used to have um, uh, somebody who worked for my family who told us stories when I was growing up. But I'm not sure how, I don't think I was really influenced. I mean, I wasn't the child who, you know, I don't have, I don't really have stories of sort of sitting around the fire and hearing stories. We didn't do that. So in some ways, I suppose the books I read told me stories. Um, the people whose conversations I, I um, appropriated. Uh. And you um, started to, you grew up and, and you, start, you enrolled as in, in a medical degree in Nigeria. Did yeah. you, why did you do well, that? That's a very good question, <laughs> and I wish I knew. No, I did that really because what happened, because when you do well in school, and I think this is something that isn't um, particular to Nigeria, that you're expected to be what we call in Nigeria a professional. And a professional means you have to be a doctor, um, maybe a pharmacist, sort of, a lawyer, an engineer, those things. Um, and so I was expected to be one of those things. And I remember being told by my teacher when I was quite young, I maybe 13, and she said, oh, of course you're going to be a doctor. I mean, it was sort of in the sense in which one's fate has been sealed. And I think I went along with that because I imagined that that was what one did. And my sister was already a doctor. My, my other sister was a pharmacist. We sort of did what we were supposed to do. And I then um, started to study medicine, and only just for a year, and it was sort of pre-meds and it wasn't the, the real thing. But I remember feeling just horribly bored by, um, you know, I just didn't, I mean, I'd spent so much of my time in secondary school doing the sciences when I really hungered to study music and art and literature, but instead I had to do the physics and the biology and the chemistry. And I think I remember just sitting down in class and, and writing poetry in the back of my notebook and just realizing this isn't right. You know, this is not right, and, you know, and life is short, and I really need to do something about it. And I just thought, you know, that's it, I'm leaving. And was it hard to break it to your parents? It was hard. It was quite hard. I kept practicing in front of the mirror how, how I would <laughs> announce it to them. But I, I really have to say that, and one of the reasons I... I'm very fortunate. My parents are really lovely people. And when I did finally, after many um, uh, mirror practice uh, <laughs> episodes... Um, then go, I remember they were having dinner and I sort of stood there um, near the dining table and I said, I have something to tell you both. And they sort of turned to me in, in horror and I don't know what they were expecting, maybe. <laughs> and I said that, you know, I wanted to leave um, medical school and they were very supportive. I remember they just said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And they said, okay, which, you know, which is quite rare. I mean, you don't leave medical school. It's quite difficult to get into. And it's not something that's done. So I... It's something I'm very grateful for. So you didn't think I'd be like Chekhov or William Carlos Williams and be a doctor as well as a writer? I had imagined that I would be that um, when I started. But just sitting in, in those classes, I just thought, I, I just can't. You know, it was five more years of horror, and I just thought, <laughs> I just can't do this. It's probably better for the patients that you did, <laughs> yes. please. <laughs> That's a, yes, because I also imagine that, yes, I mean, one has to think about the patients as well. <laughs> So you go yes. to America and you um, do a creative writing course. Yeah, I actually went and I did um, a political science. I, I didn't want to study English or, or writing because I didn't, um, I mean, particularly studying English literature, I didn't, I, I sort of felt that to do that would be to, maybe to stifle my creativity. I find that sort of the academic study of literature can, can be quite removed from the creative part of it. And so I very clearly stayed away from literature courses. And instead, I just, I remember feeling when I went to the US and, and also quite liking the American system that, um, because in Nigeria it's so rigid, you, you get into medicine and that's what you're staying to the end. I really like the flexibility of the American system that I could take classes in philosophy and political science and history. And so I did that. And I remember just sort of enjoying class and wanting to learn about everything and about the world. And so I had a fantastic time. And in the end, my, my degree was in political science and communication, which I think, you know, somebody had to invent something because I just took classes and in all sorts of things. So um, 
But you did, you have taught creative writing. And then, yes, and then afterwards I, I did do um, a master's program in creative writing, and then I did do some teaching in creative writing.